Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to our home. The uh, topic this, this night on uh, my thoughts is one verse in Torah. What does that mean? So every verse in Torah has meaning, even those that seem to be pretty straightforward. When asked, <clears throat> most people would say that the third book of the Torah, by Yikra, also known as Leviticus, is probably the most boring. It is referred to as Torah's Kohanim, the book of the priests. For the most part, it deals with the priest and the daily sacrifices that were brought in the temple. So let us examine the first verse in this verse, book, pardon me, and see <clears throat> what we can learn from it. The verse reads, el Moshe And he, God, called to Moshe, and God, again, God spoke to him from the tent of the meeting, the tabernacle. Now, at first glance, the verse seems really very simple, <clears throat> straightforward. However, when we look closely at the verse, we find there are many important lessons that we can learn from it. Now, the first thing that we notice about this verse is a small aleph at the end of the first word, vayikro, meaning, and he called. Every one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet can be found both large and small somewhere in Tanakh. As we mentioned many times, nothing's an accident. So what is the Torah telling us here by making the Aleph small? Moshe was really a stenographer who wrote down God's words as he dictated them in the Torah. At least in the first four books, he wrote, he wrote down exactly what God dictated to him word for word as if he really wasn't there. <clears throat> it said, Vaidabra Hashem el Moshe Lamar. Even though he was there, he wrote, and God spoke to Moshe, saying, The fifth book is slightly different, in that he was able to infuse some of his own phraseology. For example, it says, Vaidabra Hashem Eli Lamar, and God spoke to me, saying. So Moshe, whom the Torah refers to as the most humble of individuals, felt uncomfortable writing that God had communicated with him using the Hebrew word Vayikra, which is really a term of endearment, rather than the Hebrew word Vayikar, which comes from the word Mikra, which really translates something that occurs just kind of randomly. Moshe hesitated, but God insisted that he write the word as he had dictated to him. So Moshe really had no choice but to write the word as spoken by God. However, because of his great humility, he wrote the Aleph at the end of the word Vayikra smaller than any other Aleph that we find in the Torah. Now the Medrash asks, didn't God also call to Adam first man? Doesn't the Torah state in chapter 3 verse 9, Vayikra Hashem Elohim El Ha'adam, that God called uh, out to Adam first man? So the term Vayikra here poses no difficulty, for it's fitting for the king to speak to a sharecropper. For Adam can be seen as God's sharecropper, since God had placed him in the Garden of Eden to protect and develop it. Didn't God also speak to Noah? As the Torah states in chapter 6, verse 13, by Yomer Elohim le Noah. And God spoke to Noah. There the word Vayadabra is used, but the fact that he spoke poses no difficulty, for it's fitting for the king to speak to a zookeeper the one who cares for his animals. We know that it was Noah who had gathered all the animals in the world into the ark and provided for all their needs. Also, didn't God call out to Abravino, Abraham our father, as the verse states in 22.11, by Yikra, Allah Malach Hashem, Avram Avram. And the angel of God called out to him, Abraham, Abraham. Here also the use of the word Vayikra poses no difficulty. After all, it's fitting for the king to speak to his innkeeper. The Torah tells us that Abravino, Abraham, our father, established an inn in Be'er, Sheba. So the Medrash is somewhat difficult to understand. What led the sages to assume that the verse, by Yikra al Moshe, that he called to Moshe implies that God had never called to anyone else in the same manner that he was now calling Moshe? Additionally, what did the Medrash mean? when it prefaced its answer with the statement that it is fitting for the king. So Rashi explains that the term Vayikra, and he called, has a connotation of affection. In fact, there is another measure that tells us that the ministering angels use the same term when they address each other. 
So the use of this term of endearment in this context suggests that the Torah intends to praise Moshe and indicate the high level of spirituality that he had reached, a level at which God appeared to him by Yikra, by calling him. Our rabbis tell us that Moshe merited this level of divine favor because he had achieved a state of personal perfection as well as the highest level of Torah. Given these facts, the Medrash was faced with a dilemma. Neither Adam nor Noah, not even Avram despite their elevated levels, achieved the level of Torah that characterized Moshe. How then did they merit to be Vayikra, called by God? Are we to assume that one need not reach a level of Torah in order for God to call us? If so, why does the Torah subsequently use this term to indicate Moshe's special status? So the Medrash addresses this dilemma by explaining that it is not unbecoming for the king to address a sharecropper or his caretaker of his animals, nor his innkeeper. For Moshe Chaim Luzato in Mesil Shisharim chapter 26 writes, <clears throat> even if out of necessity of one's station in life never rises beyond that of a simple laborer, still, one can still achieve the same level of true connection with God Almighty as one who spends all of his time learning. As it states in Mishle, chapter 3, verse 6, Know him in all your ways, and he shall straighten your paths. One might assume that the only means of reaching human perfection is through constant involvement in the study of Torah and the fulfillment of its commandments. The Ramchal tells us that's not the case. Granted, that through Torah study one might find it easier to achieve true perfection, nevertheless, Every man, every man has the ability to reach the level of Devakis, a true connection with God, even if he is no more than an ordinary laborer. That is, provided that he is cognizant while he is working, that he has commandments from God, and that he is careful in observing them. In this manner, the work in which he is engaged can become a means through which he can achieve total perfection. The Talmud in Tainus 21b offers an example in the person of Abba Umna. He was a professional bloodletter, yet he merited being greeted each day by the Heavenly Academy. And for this reason, the Medrash answered his question with the phrase, it is not unfit for the king. For not only can one reach the level of being called by God through Torah study, in fact, one can even achieve this level as a sharecropper, provided the one is God's sharecropper. The Torah tells us specifically that Adam, first man, was placed in the Garden of Eden to work and protect it. And even though this role precluded Adam's involving himself in Torah study, yet it was still fitting for the king to address him, since Adam was not any sharecropper. He was God's sharecropper. The same can be said of Noah. He too lacked the opportunity to involve himself in Torah study. God had commanded him to build the ark and then to take care of the needs of the animals. Yet it, is still, it was still fitting for the king to call to him. For Noah was no simple shepherd. He was the caretaker of God's animals. The Torah doesn't tell us that Abnavino, Abraham our father, was busy studying Torah. It tells us only that he was busy greeting his guests, preparing their food, and then waiting on them as they ate. And yet... It is still fitting for the king to address him. But why? Because Abimavino, Abraham, was not just an innkeeper. He was God's innkeeper. So Adam, Noah, and Abimavino each achieved their levels of perfection by fulfilling the roles that God had designated for them. And just as Moshe achieved his level of perfection, perfection by fulfilling the role that, role that God had designated for him. Unquestionably, the optimal manner to achieve perfection is through involvement in Torah. A person who can devote himself to Torah study is actually duty-bound to do so, and he has no other means of achieving spiritual perfection. However, a person who, because of his situation or circumstances, cannot devote himself entirely to Torah, then must realize that he is still obligated to seek perfection, as the verse in Mishlei states, Behold derachecha da'ehu. Know him in all your ways. 
If one makes the effort to fulfill God's will, then his work, even if it's mundane, can serve as the vehicle to bring him to spiritual perfection. You know, there was a student of the Kotzke Rebbe, Menachem Mendel of Kotzk, who, after his father-in-law's death, was forced to leave the yeshiva and devote his time completely to running the family business. To his dismay, he found that he had really very little time to study Torah, and in his anguish, he went to go see the Kotzke. The Rebbe told him, it says in the Mishnah in Makos at the end of chapter 3, that Rebbe Hanan Yemen Akasha said that God wanted to give merit to the, nation, the Jewish nation, and therefore he gave them Torah and mitzvos in an abundant measure. So the Rebbe asked his student, why was it necessary for God to give us so much Torah and so many mitzvot? After all, which Jew has so much time that he can involve himself in an abundance of Torah and mitzvot? Less might actually be more realistic. So the Pekutzka answered, the Torah has many laws that deal with farming and commerce an abundance of laws that are part and parcel of every Jew's daily life. So whether you are in the study hall, in the field, or at your desk, there is still a great abundance of Torah and mitzvot that you are still involved in and required to do. In earlier times, it was customary to have young children begin learning Torah from the third book of the five books of the Torah, Vayikra. It really seems strange to start with the middle book and, and not the first. There's a measure that says that when God gave the Jews the Torah, he told them he had a precious treasure that he wanted to give them, but he wanted some guarantee, some assurance that they would treat it with proper reverence. They said they would give God their word. Well, he just smiled and said that that wasn't good enough. So they offered their lives, and again God said that it wasn't good enough. So then they said they would offer the lives of their young children as collateral that he accepted. And so our young children are the guarantors of the Torah. So the small Aleph in the first word Vayikra alludes to young children, our guarantors, whose pure souls say the pure words of the Torah, and they go up to heaven as a holy sacrifice, a a sweet savor to God. It is also an allusion to parents that they should sacrifice themselves to make sure that their young children get a proper Torah education. Also measures children themselves, that they too must be ready to sacrifice and dedicate themselves to learn and eternalize, internalize the holy words of the Torah. From this verse, the sages also learn why one cannot tell others what we have heard from someone else without that person's permission. When someone tells you something, that is considered a secret, even if that person did not state explicitly that the information that they said was private. This is because a person's speech is considered his private domain and just as much as any other possession that they own, no different. We cannot take someone's speech and make it public unless we have their consent. Therefore, there is no need for them to warn us that what they are telling us is private. This should be self-understood. And just as they don't need to tell us that we should not take any of their possessions and place them out in the street, so from their house, so too, as their speech has the same importance and secrecy, so to speak. How do we know? This, how do the sages know this from our verse? The verse says that God spoke to Moshe Lamor, saying, the word saying seems to be extra. The sages interpret this seemingly extra word as a command from God to Moshe that he should repeat the words he hears from God to the Jewish nation. But that statement is obvious since we know that whatever Moshe was taught, he was taught to benefit the entire nation. It was not just for his own private knowledge. So the superfluous word Lamor is written to teach us that without explicit permission, it may not be taken for granted that one is permitted to reveal that which someone else has told him. However, in our verse, Moshe is instructed by God that he should repeat it to the Jewish people. There is yet another lesson we learn from this verse. Moshe was the leader of the Jewish nation. The people had requested that he be their emissary. At the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai, they experienced God's presence. The measure says that their revelation was so sublime 
that they actually died and had to be resurrected with the dew of Tehiyat Tamesim, the revival of the dead. The experience left them in a state of trepidation, and so they asked Moshe to be their intermediary, to bring the word of God to them. So it seemed quite obvious that he should enter into the Oomoe to speak with God, so as to be able to receive instruction on whatever law God wanted the nation to know. Nevertheless, Moshe decided that going into the tent on his own was not appropriate, since he knew that only when a person is called, invited, should he enter. So from here we learn the extent to which a person should realize just how wrong it is to enter anybody's place without permission, since even such a great person as Moshe waited until he was called by God. The sages even go further and they say that even when entering your own house, one should call out a greeting so as not to startle anyone that is home. So from this one single verse in the Torah, we learn the trait of humility, the importance of giving our children a Torah education, the sanctity of work, the necessity to respect another's privacy, and the importance of good manners. All in one verse. It seems so simple. And with that, may we merit to bring in the coming of Mashiach quickly and in our time. Thank you very much for listening. God bless and be well. Stay safe, stay happy, and look forward to being together again. Have a great Shabbat.